The Dark Pictures began as a project from Supermassive to create an anthology of horror titles. They're now two games and two years into the project, and it's clear that the only concept they had when starting it was, what if, like, the monsters were all in your head? Very creative, Mr. Game Developer. Now would you like to stop snorting the neckbeard droppings out of the crevices of your keyboard long enough to give me the real pitch that's gonna make me want to invest my time in this multi-game project? Do you recall Until Dawn? That game had real monsters in it, but only after it flirted with the idea that the whole thing was a big ruse. Imagine if that game had ended right after the obnoxious rich kid pulled off his mask and revealed it was a practical joke, and you basically get the dark pictures. If they're going to stick with this theme, then this anthology has about as much suspense as a rerun of Scooby-Doo. The camera lingers for a second on a book about witches in the occult the bus driver was reading in the diner. It's one of those, ooh, I wonder if that's going to be important shots. And I suppose it is, since I'm assuming that reading that book so affected the bus driver that he would create an elaborate fantasy based off his hometown and the witch trials that were held there that would then play off his survivor's guilt to create an elaborate hallucination filled with dead people from his own past in the brief span of minutes since he put it down. Considering that witch trials were already in the town's history, I hardly think the light reading was needed as an explanation. Here's a good example of using a visual to blatantly lie since the plot is held together with dried spit and can't withstand even a momentary glance without falling apart. Since the shot in question shows multiple people inside the bus sitting right up front when in fact the bus is empty except for the bus driver. I just want to get these folks to where they need to be. I doubt a short delay will trouble him too much. The deputy redirecting traffic to Little Hope should show some concern about a bus driver referring to passengers that are not actually there. At least ask him to step out of the vehicle and submit to a sobriety test. We're going the wrong way. It's fine, just a quick detour. It's not fine. Calm down. It's all okay. Oh, please, John, could you not patronize me? Can you keep it down, please? Anthony is already deluded enough to believe that there are four people on his bus with him. Yet after the crash, he believes himself to be a different person who's friends with the people inside his head, and doesn't recall his past, his real name, or that he's the bus driver. I haven't sinned any Silent Hill games on the channel yet, but thankfully this month I get to send two games that try really hard to be spiritual successors to that franchise. Little Ho begins with a vehicle swerving off the road to avoid a dark-haired little girl who is burned in a fire and seems to be the source of all the mystery, leaving the protagonist stranded in a fog-covered and abandoned town that plays mind games with his own broken psyche while he's doggedly pursued by the twisted monsters of his own damaged mind. Little Hope is Silent Hill of R.L. Stein of Goosebumps was hired to write it. They either forgot or intentionally left out all the subtle storytelling, the masterfully crafted atmosphere, and replaced the small town with all of its streets and buildings to explore while fending off the abominations with a dwindling supply of ammo, with a single road that you walk down until you come to a building to break into, wander around inside of it until the plot is activated by a jump scare, then it's back to the highway to repeat that same sequence. This isn't horror. This is vagrancy. After the bus crashes, the game cuts to a scene set sometime in the 70s, where an entire family who all resemble the people on the bus die in an hilariously contrived house fire. Why is the game showing you this? Hmm, no reason I can think of. It's certainly not trying to set up a twist later on that will sit and rotate on this moment. Supermassive Games is making at least four of these, and I expect the choose-your-own-adventure book gameplay and quick-time events to be shared between them, but not the same plot beats. Man of Badon began with a prologue that sets up the later twist by creating misconceptions over what really happened while killing every cast member to increase the tension. That's how Until Dawn started as well. They don't know how to start a game other than this. Megan is the disturbed little sister of this house of adopted children. The game even portrays her alongside some sort of evil shadow right before the house catches fire. It's simply another visual lie to make you think the plot isn't going to pull the same trick on you as the first game did. Let me clue you into something, Supermassive Games. If you just make a game with some real supernatural elements, you wouldn't have to keep lying to our faces that something unnatural is happening. What follows is what I term a cock-up cascade. Megan, on the urging of her imaginary friend, went around the house locking everyone inside rooms before the fire started, while their dad was passed out drunk where he's crushed by a collapsing ceiling. Tanya can die in two different ways, but one of them includes her accidentally hanging herself while climbing down a pipe in one of them. Dennis is stuck in the attic after Megan knocked the ladder down, and instead of dropping the few feet to the floor, escapes out onto the ice slick roof where there would be an even larger drop to safety, then dies when he slips and is impaled on a wrought iron fence. All of their deaths serve as a plot point later on for their witch trial doppelgangers, though I'm unsure of how Anthony knew enough about Anne's death to recreate her death scenario, since she died of smoke inhalation in a bathroom unseen by him. Anthony kept those matches in his hand throughout that entire ordeal after he lit the stove, which is impossible since I saw him pick up television remotes and open doors with his hands after he left the kitchen. I have a new story for you. It's very different to the last. That's such a line you could probably build a class action lawsuit of it. This particular story isn't fully fleshed out. Now that is the honest truth. It's only part written, and the choices you make will complete it. The curator will repeat the phrase, choices matter, every time he interrupts. But I never once felt in control of things happening in the game. I got the best ending in the game and I wasn't even trying for it. Everything is in the middle of the book cliche, which is even more ridiculous here, since that book is the story of the game I'm playing, and we're still at the very beginning. 
I suppose when your characters lack the ability to escape the uncanny valley and are all annoying to one degree or another, you have to spell out what their personality is supposed to be. From the very beginning, the central concept that there is only one character who is imagining the rest falls apart because the group is split up in two groups by the crash. You mean to tell me Andrew, as he's now known, awoke from the wreck believing he was another person and two of his imaginary friends were in a different area? The imaginary people even help him do things that one person on their own couldn't do, like break open chain link fences, doors, and push over heavy crates. All modern horror has no choice but to include the scene where someone can't get a signal on their cell phone. I understand why, since horror only works in isolation, but damn am I sick of seeing it. What exactly do you see in that girl? The more you ask, the less I'll tell you. Oh, I doubt that. I can get any man to talk. The characters are annoying most of the time and boring the rest, but after you complete the game and realize that they are all stand-ins for the people who died in the house fire, their relationships with each other can get a bit creepy, since Taylor and Daniel are in a relationship now when they were brother and sister back in reality, and Angela, who was their mother, is catty with Taylor and tries to flirt with Daniel. I understood most of the symbolism in the game's character traits. For instance, all these characters are rubbing each other raw since their family was dysfunctional, but I don't get why Anthony's broken mind is shipping his sister and mom with his brother. Hey, John, any idea what caused the crash? Not sure. Looked like the driver swerved to avoid something in the road. He down there, by the way? Nope. No sign of him. Weird. He isn't up here either. These people are all a delusion of Anthony's mind, yet they mention his real self, the bus driver. Is this how they've always treated him inside his own head before tonight? As a bus driver with no other attachment, if these hallucinations have this much mental continuity, they should also be weirded out by the appearance of Andrew, who would not have been a part of their group before the crash. And this also means Andrew, who Anthony sees himself as now, still knows about his real self's existence but doesn't recognize it as him. We could be here all night. Our best move is to get to the others, then head towards town, see if we can find some help. So begins the quest of, we have to do something. We have to leave the site of the crash and go into town to find the bus driver. We have to find a phone and call for help. We have to find that little girl. Each goal is quickly replaced by another, we have to do something, before ever doing something about the previous objective. Each character at some point will decide, they have to do something, just so the game will have something to show us other than five vaguely annoying people walking down a road at night. Taylor has marks on her neck that would resemble the bruising from a hanging, except she didn't die by accidental hanging in my playthrough. My choice had her climb back inside and die to a backdraft. Someone else thinks they can do a better job? Step right up! Maybe it isn't real. We have to get out of here right I need to think straight. Why the fuck? Can everyone just shut up? If you want the best ending, the game expects you to work on the issues of its cast like you're the on-call therapist for the voices inside their patient's mind. Tell me, game. How does it make any sense that I'm trying to turn characters who don't exist into better people? The whole game is secretly about helping Anthony come to terms with the survivor's guilt, but you don't actually do much to help him overcome his issues during the game, unless you count nailing some quick time events to save the lives of his imaginary friends. There is nothing on the bus we can use to get help. In town, there will be people, a working phone, something. Buses normally come with radios for communicating for help in an emergency. Inside the bar, they come across Vince, who was Tanya's boyfriend back in the 70s. He's the only other character beside Andrew that is actually real, and suddenly meeting the person who he blamed for his girlfriend's death and his seeming 40-year depression doesn't elicit the kind of response you would expect because the game can't have him giving away the fact that he's only in the room with Anthony. Is there a phone in here? There must be a phone in the bar. Lon's dead. Since there's no working phone here, why not ask Vince where there might be one? Whatever it was, came from outside. I really think it's smart to go back outside? Well, there's nothing for us here. We need to move on. After surviving a bus crash and encountering supernatural fog that turns you around to trap you inside of it, I would expect going back out into that weirdness would be the last thing on anyone's mind. You only just walked into this place and found a sign of life. You can't be in that much of a rush. Find location, state that the location looks creepy, enter and encounter creepy things, then leave and move on to the next creepy building without having accomplished anything. How hard is it to walk down a goddamn road without being distracted by every building you pass? Oh, but there might be a phone inside this one. Maybe there is, but fat chance of it working because you're in an abandoned town with monsters and magic Fog. Little Hope also continues Supermass's love of making interacting with anything in their environments require a button press, holding in a trigger and then moving the analog stick to turn it over. If everything in life took this much effort, sign me out to become a sea slug that barely moves and filter feeds all day long. Spirits of the past will routinely grab their modern counterpart and pull them into a brief moment from the town's history during the height of a paranoid witch hunt. I was honestly interested in this idea that maybe these characters were all being reincarnated and killed in the same way again and again throughout the centuries as part of some witch's curse. Sadly, this is a case of the red herring being better than the actual plot, since this is all part of Anthony's delusion as well. For developers that tried really hard to copy Silent Hill with his release, they never realize that Silent Hill is at its best when it marries mental dilemma with an actual supernatural encounter. That game takes a broken person and then actually puts them inside a supernatural town. A little girl 
appeared out of the fog, and then just like that, she was gone again. What is going on? Maybe the fog has got you confused. We're all stressed out. How do your own delusions fail to believe you when you tell them something? That is one light-bodied wine, since there's nothing in the glass. On my travels over many years, I've witnessed many things, seen and heard many beliefs, and there's usually some element of truth in each of them. Do you think even he's already tired of this and is biting his lip from saying, yeah, the monsters aren't real this time either? Let me reassure you. You help make some decisions that will be valued later on. And some that may turn out to be... regrettable. I could do without the game cutting away from what I'm doing so the curator can remind me that choices matter. He never actually does anything but fill you in on the choices you just made. I'm just gonna say it. This is exactly what goes down in horror movies. It only happens in the subpar ones though, which often also seems to include self-aware dialogue like this. I'm trying another way. Don't you kids watch horror movies? You never ever split up. Those movies are dumb. Maybe this is the reason horror has suffered so much these past years. Every character in them can't shut up about referencing horror movies and how they shouldn't do all the stupid things you see characters do in them and end up doing the stupid thing anyways. Good writing is all about misdirection, like a magic trick, not using the literal equivalent of whataboutism to point out that everything else does it too. Maybe splitting up isn't such a good idea, Taylor. No way am I going down there. No way will I walk across that brightly lit bridge. Let me traipse down this unlit forest path instead. The three of them that pick to go across the covered bridge see something that's clearly a man on a bicycle and jump over the side, which should put them on the same path the other two just walked down, but they somehow end up in a completely different location. Angela threw away the gun I found inside a house in my game, but considering Andrew's trigger discipline and that he twice offers it barrel first Angela, I think it was the right call. Plus I played Men of Adon where hanging onto a weapon was bound to screw you over rather than help you. And what do you know? You end up shooting at Vince and possibly killing yourself in the ending if you hold onto it. This place is our best shot. There must be a radio or a working phone inside. What makes you think you'll find a working phone or radio inside an abandoned police station? Then again, Man of Madon did have a working radio in a 70-year-old abandoned ship in their last title, so what do I know? I want to point out that Anthony slash Andrew, the bus driver, is not with these two. So how is he having delusions about what they're up to in a location he's never been to? If the point is to find a way out of town, why the hell is each group entering a building that will certainly not lead them out of town? They've come across a map of Little Hope. It's a one-road town. The way out is just up the road. If they stopped getting distracted, they would be there by now. I don't like the idea of being out here on my own. I'll be as fast as I can. If you see anything weird, just yell. I'll come running. Did Daniel turn to look at the camera as he said that? He was addressing Taylor when he started talking and he turned to someone off to her left that isn't there. Taylor, the door won't open. Okay, I'll look for another way around. Daniel gets inside only to find the back door won't open. So Taylor tells him she will look for another way around, which she ends up finding, which also means entering this old store was completely unneeded if she could just walk around the damn thing. Do the spirits from the past have to pull the same jump scare approach every time they want to show one of them something from the past? Charles Dickens was smart enough to write his Ghost of Christmas Pass as someone who at least introduced himself first. Never mind how it looks. All we need is one phone to still be hooked up. They started out looking for the bus driver, but the cast has forgotten about him already, which I should point out is a bit odd considering these people are all inside the bus driver's head, but the bus driver clearly knows that he exists as well. Now they're looking for a working phone in an abandoned building. I'm starting to see why Anthony failed to save any of his family member from a burning house. He sucks at planning. <laughs> my cat doesn't even react to these jump scares anymore. No evil word shall leave my lips. Should you breathe a word, or the edge of a word about the other things? Then I will come to you in the black of some terrible night and bring a reckoning that will shudder you. Reverend Carver, who led the funeral for Anthony's family that burned in the house fire, is a bizarre choice for Andrew's mind to cast as the villain in the witch trials. The only thing we saw him do was officiate the funeral, and there was a letter from him that expressed worry over Megan's behavior, and Anthony likely hasn't seen him since. There's a collapsed bridge in the middle of the town that would be impossible to drive across. However, the police were rerouting traffic through this town and its one road, meaning no one would actually detour this way. And speaking of that detour, no other car has ever passed by in the night. Please, sir! You must help me! You must! Abigail begs the guy who looks just like her husband instead of her actual husband who is standing right there. The monsters are those who were killed during the witch trials 300 years ago, and they target their modern counterpart and try to kill them in some way that parallels their own death. And they are very slow about it. So slow I don't see how anyone would have trouble avoiding them. 
That's Daniel's doppelganger. It's been established that a doppelganger only targets its modern self, and Daniel is with Taylor back at the bridge, so it shouldn't be following Andrew, John, and Angela away from him. The shadow that spooked the three of them into jumping off the first bridge was Vince from the bar on his bicycle. There's also the issue that the group left him behind in the bar. Then he somehow got to the covered bridge ahead of them even though this is a one-road town. And now he's somehow gotten ahead of them again even though the second bridge is impassable due to it being collapsed. And there was no bicycle parked outside the bar he was drinking in either. I'll go in and take a look around. Why? There is no reason to get off the road and look through yet another abandoned building that you will inevitably leave. Ghosts are pulling you to the past to watch people who look like you die gruesome deaths and you just witness a monster try to kill one of the members of your group. And you're feeling horny? You scared us half to death. Don't speak to me of death. This day, I have pulled my wife's body from a watery grave and buried her. I'll never get over how the people from the witch trials 300 years ago are not surprised at all by the people from the future just showing up in the middle of a town gripped by paranoia. Quite accepting of that for Puritans. Nothing. No working phone anywhere. Who would have guessed there would be no working phones inside the boarded up home in a ghost town? Angela is dragged into a sewer by her doppelganger, and there is zero chance a town composed of a single road and about ten houses had a sewer system this expansive. It's even got two different levels to it. You know you can push the door wider instead of squeezing through the gap. They go into another goddamn house just to get back to the road which they left to go inside the house. At this point I think you could capture these people with a box and a stick if you painted a window on it. Daniel and Taylor run into another collapsed section of the highway, which again forces me to question why traffic was diverted through this town. Taylor comes across an old tire swing that she created as a child that is somehow here in the town, since Andrew isn't even here to experience his own delusions, and no other character comes across something from their non-existent past. I don't really know what to make of this. I suppose this was something Tanya made before she died in the house fire? But why does a delusion inside a crazy man's head need convincing? I am thoroughly sick of having to juggle this plot point every time I send something. If my current version of Adobe Premiere included a Starwipe transition, I would bring back the Starwipe joke for jump scares I retired. After all, if the game is going to use cheap jump scares to transition to the past, I might as well add an even cheaper transition effect on top of them. The tailor from the past was burnt at the stake. How does that correlate with the bruises on the current tailor's neck? The developers went and made a second monster design for Taylor based on which of the two deaths she received as Tanya, but they couldn't change the bruises on her neck to burns to reflect that same choice. It's chasing you at a glacial pace. Simply walk briskly in between smoke breaks and it will never catch up with you. Tabitha might as well be in a three-legged race with Jesus while they both carry their own cross. Vince seems almost as broken as Anthony, since he stayed in this dead town for over 40 years after his girlfriend died. If he doesn't have some playable inner demons to explain why he's wandering around this town tonight, I'm going to be upset. You gotta help us get out of here. We lost friends tonight and we just want to go home. Hey. Sure, sure, I, I hear you. Vince doesn't question what Andrew means by friends. Since to Vince, there's only ever been Anthony. I'll go get help. So Vince knows where there's a phone to make a call. Something he could have mentioned back at the bar when the obviously distraught man came in asking for help after a crash. We're safer in here. We're staying put. Let's stay inside the church. Let's move to the room full of glass windows that anything could break. Quick, let's leave the church. If these assholes could commit to even a single good idea, I would be so happy. Get out of sight! Hide! Just run. It's not very fast. That's even what they do after hiding unsuccessfully and it works. I'm sure everyone was so surprised that the character presumed dead without an on-screen death is actually alive. If you've played any of Supermass's previous games, you know they don't kill a character with a fade to black. They give you every grisly detail so you know for sure. Andrew gets separated from the others after Daniel's doppelganger attacks, which is interesting since all the characters are inside Andrew's head. If the voices have stopped, that should mean he's healed. But everything and everyone may not be quite what they appear to be. Do you think this guy is going to be this smug every game when the plot is just another rendition of everything is not as it appears? The thing that carries a burnt stake on its back was able to get that close without either of them noticing. The scene continuity is all broken. The doppelganger throws Taylor to the ground then turns to face Daniel, and the very next shot is of Taylor's doppelganger dragging her away. How long exactly did Daniel wait around before deciding to chase after his girlfriend being dragged away? She's nowhere in sight once he starts giving chase, and I've mentioned how slow these things are. I'm not sure why the rest didn't run to help them. They were all standing outside the building when Tabitha attacked, but they're nowhere to be seen after the screaming starts. They stopped even coming up with reasons for entering every building they come across. Their plan now is to stop Mary somehow from causing more executions, and how does entering a rundown factory help? They go inside, rummage around, then right back outside. Some would have me speak out against Mary, but could a child truly be capable of such evil? This is tough. I get that. 
I've only now made the realization that I'm playing a horror game where I control a group of annoying people and make decisions that affect their fate, while they are in turn playing another game where they try to influence the events of a different story. It should have been impossible for Daniel to fall into the hole the crate they pushed over and made in the floor. That crate was stacked on top of another crate, which is still there after the floor collapses and Daniel stumbles into it. He should have stumbled right into the other crate instead. Also, despite the crate falling through the floor, it is nowhere to be seen in the basement while Daniel confronts his doppelganger. This scene feels almost identical to the time Angela was trapped underground and chased by her doppelganger. If Daniel survives, he even gets chased further underground by it like she did. This is the family home that burned down at the beginning, so it all ends where it began cliché. <coughs> the two town marshals have no problem lifting up more stones to crush John's doppelganger, while the main cast struggle to move them off him. How do two guys moving two more rocks onto the plank make up for the stones three people already removed from it? At best, they only made it for the weight that was removed, which wasn't enough to crush John's doppelganger. The rest just stand there and watch as Angela and John fight off their doppelgangers. One final house tour, jump scare, witch trial, and exit to wrap it up. I didn't like Man of Madon very much either, but at least that game had a better structure than wandering from house to house until things happened. About half a mile or so, there's a diner with a working phone. You call for help and you leave this place. That's the same diner Anthony drove away from at the beginning of the game. How would they reach it by going in the opposite direction? You're not alone here. Take it easy on We've yourself. We've all been through hell, yeah, right? We're finally getting out of this hell. Blame yourself. <laughs> and now the big reveal that it was the bus driver by himself the entire time. And everything you just went through was him hallucinating his dead family as friends and teachers all to resolve himself of his guilt. As well as New England Puritans during the witch trials who were killed and cursed to be reborn over and over again. I don't think it's possible to diagnose this psychosis. Yeah, I'm fine. I just want to get these folks to where they need to be. Yeah, I'm fine. I just want to get these folks to where they need to be. The bus driver at the beginning of the game had a different voice actor. That's it. Game over. You're done. The curator sounds just as disappointed by that as I was. Until we meet again. Maybe in the Arabian Desert. Maybe somewhere else. Sequel baiting. This particular story isn't fully fleshed out. 